It must be the hypocrites turning back. Let my people go. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. I have a little book he gave to me. Said a victory. Let my people go. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. Is Lessons and Legacies of Civil Rights Leader Fannie Lou Hamer. And my name is Paul Ortiz. I am a history professor at the University of Florida, and I direct the University of Florida Oral History Program. Uh, on behalf of the University of Florida, we are so grateful and honored that you can be with us this evening. We greatly value the intellectual and academic partnership uh, that you have extended to us here at Delta State University. It's always a treat and a privilege to be able to work with great colleagues like Arlene Sanders, uh, Dr. Stacy White, a uh, professor over at Mississippi Valley, uh, and especially the, the community. Uh, we have been guided in our five years of oral history work here by people like Margaret Block, a former field organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, by people like uh, Mr. Otis Brown, uh, incredible SNCC activists who have adopted us and have opened doors for us. We tell our students at the University of Florida that in oral history, we do not go out to study people. We go out to learn from them. And we are just, again, so grateful that you have uh, adopted us and welcomed us into the Delta. It really means a lot to us. We have really thrived in this intellectual partnership, and we hope that we can give back a little bit uh, of what we have learned. Um, I, at this point, I would like to uh, welcome my colleague uh, Arlene uh, Sanders up to the podium. And Arlene, I think you want to say uh, some words and uh, introduce one of your students. Thank you. Good evening. I'd just like to welcome each of you here with us tonight, and we. We know that you will learn something um, about organizing so that you may become the great organizers of, the, of this generation. We also have, in conjunction with the Diversity Advisory Committee, we have our chairperson here, Ms. Georgine Clark. Um, she so willingly works with us, and we have some or other of our diversity committee members here, and we're just grateful that you came, and the students, of course, we're just grateful that you came to share with us with these wonderful panelists that we have here tonight. Also, we sponsor this program in conjunction with the undergraduate chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and we'd like to welcome the vice president here, and I'll cede the floor with her to her so that she may say a few words. Good evening. The Kappa Pi chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated joins together tonight with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program presenting the fourth annual Civil Rights History in Delta entitled Let Civil Rights Leader Fannie Lou. We are glad to have you here tonight and we welcome you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. There is a program with a picture of this beautiful woman, Fannie Lou Hamer, on the cover, and it gives you the details, the biographies of our distinguished panelists, and we want to thank them at the outset 
Uh, they all had to travel here uh, many hundreds, if not maybe over a thousand miles. So let's start by thanking our panelists for making the journey. Again, you will note their distinguished biographies in the program, and I'm going to skip kind of fast forward over that so we can get right to the panelists. Also, if you turn your program around, you will see uh, our co-sponsors listed. And we really could not do this program or organize the program without a lot of help and support driving all the way up from Gainesville, Florida. Um, and this is kind of a, a movement lesson that we've learned. You can't do anything meaningful by yourself, right? You have to build a coalition, you have to organize, you have to do it in solidarity with a lot of people. So uh, please check out our co-sponsors. And I'm gonna talk just briefly about um, the, the panel tonight, how we will proceed uh, in the order and so on and so forth. So we will start by uh, hearing from our panelists. I'm gonna ask each of them to go for uh, 15 minutes uh, because there are a lot of us and so maybe 15, maybe I'll be a little lenient, but, but 15 to 20 is, is, is our, our limit. Uh, so that we'll have some time at the end for uh, some, some dialogue with the audience. And when you get to like two or three minutes, I'll hold up my program and just kind of wave it frantically uh, and ask you to kind of start wrapping it up. Um, I'll ask the audience to hold your questions or comments until the end, on uh, which at that time we will have a dialogue. Um, before we start, we want to start the way that we did in the movement years. Uh, and that is not just by talking and not just by intellectualizing, uh, but by singing. Uh, singing and music is an activity that builds solidarity. And I would like to ask uh, Margaret Block and Reverend Alan Bean to come up and they're going to lead us in some song, but they're not going to be the only people singing, by the way. Right? <laughs> no. Good evening. Uh, I told Dr. Ortiz, you never invite a poet to do anything, because you know I'm going to do one of my poems. I'm, you know, you, a poet is going to always do the spoken word first. And I wrote this, and I really got involved in writing If You Don't Vote, Don't Cry by talking to some an elected official and asked me what did I mean when I told people to vote or die. And this is my answer to her. But now it's really important for you young people to hear this in the climate of America today with the voter uh, ID laws and all these other things they're throwing in our way. And it's entitled, If You Don't Vote, Don't Cry. If you don't vote, don't cry. We told you before to vote or die. When things get really bad and you have to walk because you can't buy gas and your walk is no longer all spiffy and spry, well, walk on, brother, because if you don't vote, don't cry. When you, go to, when you go to the store and the prices have gone through the ceiling and hit the sky and you're walking around cussing and telling everybody that these prices are too damn high and you don't know what you're going to buy, well, if you don't vote, don't cry. If you find yourself between a rock and a hard place and you can't pay your mortgage and have to downsize to a smaller space and you can't keep the tear from your eye, well, if you don't vote, don't cry. If you get laid off from your job and things for you are already hard and all you can do is throw up your hands and ask God why and you can't keep a tear from your eye, well, if you don't vote, don't cry. If you get really ill and can't go to, doc go to the doctor because you can't pay the bill, not to mention buying those expensive pills, and you feel just like you're going to die, well, if you don't vote, don't cry. If you go off to school and you complied with all of the rules and you can't get a grant or a student loan and have to pack your bags and go back home and you all angry up and upset and tell your mother that the world is gonna pass you by, well, if you don't vote, don't cry. If you, if you lose your food stamps and your Section 8 and you call your worker to get it straight and she tell you that mid, 
that knit the nitwit rummy cut your benefits and didn't say why. Well, if you don't vote, don't cry. We told you before to vote or die. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of these freedom songs. We organized, uh, that's how we organized around singing these freedom songs. We brought people together just by singing these songs. Mrs. Hamer was famous for her singing. You can buy the CDs now off of Amazon, and the title of the, the CD is uh, The Voices of the Civil Rights Movement. And Mrs. Hamer was a great songster, but I'm gonna do two of her selections because it's important in this climate, in this day and age, that you guys, that you young people got to learn how to live out loud and take a stand. And music has always been um, a motivating force for organizing people. And one of Ms. Hamer's songs, I'm gonna do two. We going, we're going to do two. We're going to do Go Tell It on the Mountain and This Little Light of Mine, two of Ms. Hamer's favorite songs. <laughs> Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain to let my people go go tell it on the mountain over the hills and Dressed in red, let my people go. It must be the children Bob Moses Lee. Let my people go. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and Must be the children for their civil rights. Let my people go. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. the hypocrites turning back let my people go go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain to let my people go I have a little book This song, if, even if you're an atheist, you know this song, and it was Mrs. 
all had our songs. Mine was ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. But I have good reason for singing that because I got ran out of Tallahatchie County in the middle of the daytime in the back of a hearse. <laughs> And I went back and they ran me out again. Then I went back and I slowed it singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Although I'm not gonna sing, I might sing it now that I that Lauren is clapping now. <laughs> <laughs> ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking. Keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let me rom me. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let me rom me. Turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, on a talking, a marching up to freedom. I'm laying. Ain't gonna let me but to turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let me but to turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let injustice turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let injustice turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, I'm marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let miseducation turn me round. Turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let this education turn me round. Gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking. I'm gonna build a brand new world. Freedom. Slavery, no more slavery, no more slavery over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. No more lynchings, no more lynchings, no more lynchings over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free oh freedom oh freedom oh freedom over me and be for i'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. That song kind of broke me up because when we were in Oxford, Ohio for the Mississippi Freedom Summer, I remember standing around the tree singing that song when Mickey Shrunk and James Goodman and Andy Good, James Cheney and Ed, Andy Goodman left coming back to Mississippi to investigate 
the burning of Mount Zion Church in Neshoba County. And I really don't, I don't have that in my, it just tears, it does something to me because I have flashbacks about that day and I was really good friends with Mickey and James, J.E. as we call them. Okay, thank you. Let's give one more round of applause to Margaret and Reverend Alan Dean. Well, every early September, a group of very enthusiastic uh, University of Florida students and staff pile into vans and leave for the Mississippi Delta. And we have grown so much over the past five years and I want to acknowledge our students and staff, if you wouldn't mind uh, standing uh, to show who you are. Don't be shy. Um, there's some students outside. These students do excellent work. They come here and they do oral history interviews. And increasingly, we have tried to uh, hold more events, more educational events. Last year, for example, we hosted uh, Mr. Lawrence Guillot, uh, who, of course, was founding chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, and we took, we were able to take Mr. Guillot to um, area high schools and talk to high school youth. Uh, tomorrow, uh, here's another example. Our students have organized a social change and media workshop. Avis Thomas Lester, a, a, as many of you know, a legendary writer with the Washington Post, now senior editor of the Afro-American newspaper, the oldest continuously published African-American newspaper in these United States, is going to do a Skype workshop down at the Sunflower County Freedom Project uh, at uh, five o'clock, is that correct? Uh, and we want to invite you, if you're interested in the media and how to use the media as a tool for social change, there's not many people that do it better than Avis Thomas Lester. So we're gonna be down in Sunflower tomorrow with the students in that wonderful program, and we would encourage you to attend that as well. If you want to learn more about the University of Florida Oral History Program, the Samuel Proctor uh, Program, we have brochures on the table. Uh, we also are very honored, uh, Judge Bailey was so kind to bring some of his books, and I believe those are for sale in the front. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to check those out, please do on your way out. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, you could probably talk Judge Bailey to maybe signing. Uh, a copy of those. We really appreciate you bringing those, those books. So without further delay, I'm going to just briefly introduce the panelists and ask them to speak in the order um, if you want to look at your program now. Uh, our first panelist is going to be Judge Yami Bailey. Uh, he, of course, is you, I'll just read the very opening of each introduction, has enjoyed a long and diverse career as an activist, a politician, an attorney, a writer, an actor, a public uh, servant and a jurist. He drove all the way down from Memphis, Tennessee to be with us today. Thank you, Judge Bailey. Um, we're, and then the next speaker will be Bill Chandler, who drove up from the opposite direction, uh, from Jackson. Uh, he's a veteran of the United Farm Workers. I was especially excited to be able to get Bill here uh, because I also was a member of the United Farm Workers uh, in the 1980s. And he's going to talk about uh, an incredible coalition building effort in the state of Mississippi to try to stay back some of the anti-immigration uh, hysteria that we've been dealing with. Uh, another dear friend of the UF Oral History Program is Mr. John Dew, Attorney John Dew. Uh, he has been uh, with us as a freedom fighter in Florida for many years. He is currently working with a brand new uh, student activist coalition called the Dream Defenders uh, as an elder as an, a, and as a trusted advisor. Um, our next speaker, uh, after John will be Margaret Kibbe. Uh, Margaret was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, she spoke and just blew us away three years ago on, a, on, on this panel. Uh, I think we had it over in the archives building. Uh, and so we asked her if she wouldn't mind doing an encore performance and she kindly agreed. Um, the next speaker will be my colleague from the University of Florida, Dr. Gwendolyn Zohar Simmons. Uh, Dr. Simmons was a former SNCC project coordinator in Laurel, Mississippi. And she is a professor at the University of Florida. I'm, I'm happy to say an incredibly popular, powerful, and inspiring professor. It's just great to um, as a role model and as a dear friend. 
And our final speaker is a person who I believe wins the award uh, in terms of the distance traveled to be with us, uh, Mr. Bright Wynn, who was a member of SNCC and COFO in the Delta from 64 to 1965, flew out all the way from San Francisco. How about that? So let's go ahead and start, Judge Rielka, and you can either uh, sit or come up here to the podium if you'd like. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, Professor Ortiz, I salute the work that you're doing and the Oral History Project at Florida. I want to thank my dear friend uh, inviting me, and, and uh, she's always not only been a, a great freedom fighter of, of days uh, past, but she continues to fight. And uh, I remember when we were struggling in Memphis over the uh, question of whether the Civil Rights Museum would be sold to a corporate controlled foundation, uh, we, we, we demonstrated to protest that and successfully, uh, it's still owned by the state of Tennessee, but Ms. Block was one of several people who came in to join us in that, in that battle. My uh, experience in civil rights goes back, I guess, uh, I'll skip my early years. You can, you can kind of read about that in my book if you get the education of a black radical. The cover of which, by the way, they didn't say this in the book, actually comes from one of the pages of my FBI file, which I got after several <laughs> inquiries through the Freedom of Information Act. They once had me labeled Diami Bailey uh, subversive, and then they changed the title to, to Diami Bailey, Black Nationalist. But uh, I grew up in Memphis in the 1950s and 1940s, I finished high school in 59. Uh, and at that time, Memphis was uh, very segregated, but Memphis, Tennessee did not have the sharp racial divisions that other parts of the Deep South experienced in the 1950s and 60s. In fact, blacks didn't really have much trouble voting in Memphis uh, in the 1940s and 50s. We were, the city was run largely by Boss Crump, political boss figure there, uh, very renowned, and, and part of his machine was uh, supported by the black vote. And so Boss Crump made sure that blacks registered and voted, and he made sure they voted for the Crump machine. And so when the Crump machine came to uh, its demise in the mid-50s, there was already a tradition of blacks voting in Memphis, and blacks then began to get involved in the political process, running people from off for office, um, and supporting black candidates and, and those white candidates who were not uh, racial um, segregationists. I had trouble seeing this, the, the arms on this watch here, so I had to check my phone, so I'll back in my time. Uh, <clears throat> so when I came out of high school in Memphis in 1959, uh, I came down to Southern University in Baton Rouge. And I didn't have any idea as a young college student, uh, first generation, my brother was a year ahead of me going to Southern to play football on a scholarship out of Memphis. And most of my contemporaries were going to Tennessee State in Nashville, but since my brother was at Southern, I went down there. And it was my first year at Southern uh, in 1960 as a freshman that those four students at North Carolina AT&T in Greensboro went and sat in. Now, I was the president of freshman class down there. Southern was the largest all-black university in the country. And, um, um, but I was down there to get an education and to party and to look at all, all the pretty girls and, and have a good time. I didn't go down there with the idea of getting involved in any movement. There was civil rights work with some of the NAC people, C people, CP people in Memphis uh, as a volunteer. But it was in 1960 when those kids went to jail and they didn't go to jail, but they sat in at the lunch counter in Greensboro. And that was in uh, uh, February of 1960. And I'm glad to see these college students that are here today because um, it was students like you who are here now uh, who had the courage to 
do like those kids at Greensboro and the kids at Southern eventually went and sat in too in 1960. And that spread across different college campuses. And what we found, I wasn't one of the kids who went down to, to, to downtown Baton Rouge and got arrested there sitting at the segregated lunch counters. But we all supported them and we marched because the president of the university was putting them out of school because they'd been arrested. That was what was happening to a lot of these black students at these colleges. Not only did the black students face uh, going to jail, but they also were being expelled from the universities. That was happening, it happened here at Jackson State University in Mississippi. Um, it happened at Southern, it happened over in uh, Alabama. And so Southern was of course run by black administrators and we as students ended up fighting the black administrators. Uh, and so our mission got diverted because the state government put these black administrators out to stop our movement. And by us being involved in that fight uh, and these kids having to fight the legal fights that they were facing in going to jail, the movement eventually uh, was killed. It wasn't killed because you can't kill the spirit of a movement. Once the seed is planted, it continues to nurture and to grow. Uh, but momentarily it stopped. And the arrest of those students at Southern in 1960 uh, led to the first United States Supreme Court decision. Uh, those kids were convicted in Louisiana for uh, violating the, disturbing the peace law. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And one of the things that was very important to us in the movement was the role that lawyers played because it was, there were lawyers who, from Baton Rouge and from New Orleans and from New York, the Legal Defense Fund, uh, who carried that case to the uh, United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, for the first time in 1962, uh, came out with a decision reversing the conviction of these Southern University students in a case called uh, Ghana versus Louisiana, Ghana being one of those Southern students that was arrested. And the Supreme Court said you can't arrest kids, didn't say kids, but you can't arrest protesters uh, and charge them with breach of the peace because as black students, they go into a segregated restaurant, sit at a lunch counter, and then somebody else beats them up. But the argument of the state was that, that they were creating a disturbance of the peace by going in and sitting down, and the people were going to beat them up. And the Supreme Court said that dog won't hunt and overturned that conviction and for the first time set out some rights of demonstrators that protected other demonstrators across the South. Another case that came out of Southern two years later was a case of Cox versus Louisiana, Reverend B. Elton Cox, who came back two years after these first wave of protests and led other demonstrations at Southern. And uh, that's when I was expelled from university in 1962. Uh, but Reverend Cox and I, uh, he passed just uh, within the last year, but was one of the great leaders and warriors working with the Congress for Racial Equality. Well, the second wave of protests that started at Southern in 1962, uh, I was a bit more involved in, and um, uh, some students had gone down and gotten arrested and, um, because the lunch counters were still segregated. And so we knew what had happened two years earlier, and so we decided that we would, uh, first of all, march down to the jail where they were arrested and protest. And so, of course, the university didn't want us to do it, and they wanted to <coughs> stop our movement, but, uh, and, we, and, and the buses that were gonna take us from the southern campus to downtown Baton Rouge, the drivers were intimidated, and some of them wouldn't take the students. And so private cars and people uh, came along and helped ferry some of the students down. It's about eight miles or so from the campus to downtown Baton Rouge. But we finally managed to straggle down to downtown Baton Rouge, uh, where these kids were in jail. And uh, I, along with Reverend Cox and some others, were at the head of the march of about 3,000 Southern University students that ended up in the center of downtown Baton Rouge on, on a day in, in um, December. I write about that day in my book, I'll just read you a little bit about it. We got down to the jailhouse, and being at the head of the march, I was standing right next to Reverend Cox, who was helping to lead the march. And the police came up, the police captain stopped us and said to Reverend Cox, now you can't, we've let y'all come downtown, but you can't carry this march for us. You gotta turn this march around. And Reverend Cox said, well, we came down here to peacefully demonstrate. We're going to the jailhouse, and uh, when we finish our protest, then we'll disassemble. So the policeman backed off, and we continued marching. He got out of the car about a block further down the road, and he said, 
Now you've had your say and I'm gonna have mine. I want you to turn this march around. So Cox refused. Well, they didn't do anything then and we continued on to the jail. And we stood out in front of the jailhouse in downtown Baton Rouge, lying in the street and there was a mob of, it wasn't a huge mob, probably 100, 150 people. And there was a line of police officers between the students and these people that were in front of the jail. And our students were on the second floor of the jailhouse which faced the street. So we had our march there. Then we started to listen to the speeches and Reverend Cox was out in the center of the speech talking. And he gave a speech and as he was talking, the students who were in the jail began to sing. Ms. Block was talking about the strength of singing. And they began to sing freedom songs from in the jail. And that really uplifted our spirits and unnerved the police. And Reverend Cox, as he finished his speech, he was saying, now, youngsters, uh, it's 12 o'clock now, we're all hungry, and they got restaurants all the way downtown that we can go eat at. <laughs> now I'll go to my book. It is impossible to describe what it felt like to be shot with tear gas. I could say it makes your skin sting and burn so badly you think it is peeling off your hands and face. I could say it makes your eyes feel as if they've been set on fire and then it makes your eyes water so steadily you cannot see. I could say that when the harsh pungent gas fills your lungs it is as if two great hands have reached up and squeezed your diaphragm and then placed a bag over your head so you cannot breathe. But these descriptions while accurate don't convey the full effect of the experience. Even more difficult to explain is that the anger I felt that December afternoon as the tear gas canisters exploded throughout the streets of downtown Baton Rouge was of an intensity I had never before known. All the hellish years, all the indignity and injustice, all the times a white person had refused to acknowledge me, all the times I had been insulted welled up inside of me. All those feelings and memories broke through the walls of restraint I had built around them and came together in one hard mass of anger and some part of me said no more. Some part of me said I will not live my light in life in the back alleyways of the world. And as I hardened myself to the fact that though my purpose was good, if I stood by it, anything could happen. The instant Sheriff Clemens hollered, move him out. One of the deputies threw a tear gas canister that struck Reverend Cox on the ankle as it exploded knocking him to the ground. As several students rushed to carry Cox to safety, canisters exploded in quick succession up and down St. Louis Street. Confused and hysterical, we all began running, blindly trying to escape the swirling gas. Shoes, umbrellas, and purses littered the streets. I could hear the unmistak unmistakable barking of police dogs and the whining of the sirens mixing with the almost overwhelming noise of students' screams, scattered singing and the sharp explosions of the tear gas canisters. Of course, there was nothing to do but run, to run as far as you could, and to run and to try not to wipe your eyes because as I found out too late, the tear gas made it worse. As I ducked down the nearest alley, I reminded myself that I had known that this was a possibility before I had agreed to come. I reminded myself that the police could and would get away with whatever they wanted to. I tried to convince myself that I had known and expected these things, but I hadn't. Not really. I hadn't known I would be so afraid. I hadn't known about the dogs or about not being able to breathe. I hadn't known what it would feel like to wonder as I ran with the police at my back if they might use those shotguns and if the, bull and if the bullets might hit me. But I ran anyway. I ran down alleys and tried to catch my breath in the doorways of buildings when, the nearest, when a cloud of gas overwhelmed me. I closed my eyes and groped my way along the nearest wall. I ran looking for safety and fresh air, and I felt that though I might eventually find some air to breathe, I would never be safe anywhere. I hated that feeling, but I hated the white police more. We made it back from downtown, scattered, battered, truly battered, some of us, some were in jail, arrested that day. But we got back to the church in Scotlandville, just off the southern campus. And you could, the whole auditorium was full of the stench of tear gas because it was in your clothes and it was 
all on the students. And we marched from the church over to President Clark's house. By this time, it was early evening because we wanted him to assure us that he wasn't going to throw these kids out of school as he'd done before with those others. And he promised that he wouldn't, and then he did. And so we started a boycott of class, and history repeated itself until we went in a fight with the administration. Now, Bob Zellner, where does SNCC come in? Because um, Louisiana was more a state that was being organized by the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. Uh, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama were more states that were involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Um, CORE was run by James Farmer, a very prominent and courageous black man. I hit, the CORE headquarters was in New York City. Um, CORE had a field secretary that was paid minimum, minimum salary to come in and help organize in Baton Rouge. Reverend Cox is one of the field secretaries for CORE. Dave Dennis was another who later became deeply involved in COFO and the project in Mississippi. But Dave was in Baton Rouge with us at the time, helping to stir us up. Well, Dion Diamond was a core activist as well. And Dion had come in to Baton Rouge, and I didn't know that some of these people like Dion had this movement passed, but he suddenly appeared on the Southern campus, stirring up the students and speaking. And Dion was an eloquent young man, an eloquent speaker, and he got the students riled up and as we were trying to organize and march and protest against the administration and against downtown. And Dion got arrested. Well, I'd met Bob Zellner. Uh, Bob uh, and I were students together in a seminar that was being uh, organized, uh, uh, sponsored by the United States National Students Association. You see, in the uh, 1960s, uh, students were much better organized nationally than you find today, particularly progressive students. Now, you get conservative students who are organized today in different parts of the country, but in the 1960s, we had an organization called the United States National Student Association with chapters on campuses around the country. Some of them, many of them, were white chapters. In fact, when I went to my first convention of National Student Association, it was my first year at Southern, 1960, and one of the big debates at that campus was about the fact that the National Student Association had taken a public position endorsing the sit-in movement, and that split the organization because the schools that were from the South, the white schools, wanted to pull out. But I'd met Bob Zellner the next year in a summer program sponsored by the United States National Student Association called the Southern Student Human Relations Seminar, which was being run by Connie Curry and Will Campbell. And we were at the University of Wisconsin, and there were 18 students, nine black and nine white, who spent a month there at the university, reading books, learning about ourselves, learning about race, and learning about courage. And Bob was one of those students, as was I. Chuck McDo had been in the program the year before. Another student that was in the program with us that summer uh, in Wisconsin was uh, uh, Walter Williams, who, had been the, who later went back to Jackson State as a student body president and got thrown out at Jackson State because of his organizing protests there. But, when the students were arrested and thrown out of school at Southern in 1962, they banned us from coming back on the campus. And so we had to stay in the downtown hotel, a black hotel, the Lincoln Hotel. And um, so Bob Zellner and Chuck McDew came to Baton Rouge to see Dion, since he was the field secretary for SNCC. And so they went down to the jail, they stopped to see us at the hotel, and then they left the hotel and went together down to the jail. Well, when they got down to the jail to visit them, they opened up Bob's briefcase and they found some organizing material and they arrested them and charged them with conspiracy and criminal anarchy, claiming they were going to overthrow the government. And so then they had Bob Zellner, Chuck McDo, and Dion Diamond, along, along with our people in the jail. Now, I'm going to wrap up by saying that, because we'll have time to, and you know, you've got some other great people to talk to. But I kept, that was how I began to learn about SNCC was, was through people like Bob and, and Dave Dennis who went down to Mississippi after he left Baton Rouge. And um, uh, I found that uh, uh, it was, I used to go to Atlanta to their meetings, they, uh, down at their office. I first met Fannie Lou Hamer 
actually after I'd been expelled from school at Southern and I was going to school in the Northeast and I used to go to uh, the Yale University campus at Northern Student Movement, which was a support, support organization for the Southern students. And uh, Miss Hamer would come up there with some of the SNCC people and sing. And that's when I first heard her sing, this little light of mine. And, and I later, years ago, went and visited her at her home down in Sunflower in Ruleville. She was getting ready to go give a talk up east somewhere. And we sat on her front porch and uh, on a little dusty road and people came by waving at her and, and she just continued to talk. So I had the great honor. I had supplied a law student actually to support Miss Hamer in her work. Uh, uh, who now is the uh, head of the families first. So I'm going to stop right now. Thank you. Thank you. I grew up in a very different uh, situation than uh, my brother that preceded me. I grew up in Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles, in the San Gabriel Valley in the 50s. And he talked about graduating from high school in 1959, so did I. But I had a different kind of life. I started working full time when I was 16 because there was tensions in my family that I knew nothing about, but it caused me to leave home. And I worked my way through high school, not college, but high school. And almost immediately after graduating from high school, I became involved with the community service organization during the daytime, which was a uh, forerunner of the United Farm Workers Union, CSO as it was called. And they were doing urban organizing in the Latino community. And the community that I came from was about 50% Latino, and it included large numbers of African Americans, Japanese Americans, and of course, Anglos uh, in what is now close to downtown Los Angeles. Boyle Heights, if anybody's familiar with Los Angeles, that uh, is a very broad description of the neighborhood, although we had names for smaller neighborhoods. But we became very interested in the civil rights movement through a series of personal things that happened to us. One, when I was 13, I was with a group of kids at a movie theater in downtown Los Angeles watching a Spanish language movie that starred Pedro Infante. And halfway through the movie, the lights went on and the border patrol came in and arrested all the people who looked Latino, all the brown people that were in the theater. And those of us who were uh, very few of us who did not look Latino uh, were left behind. They took those people from the audience, put them on buses, prison buses and flatbed steak trucks with wooden benches and carted them from Los Angeles to Tijuana and dumped them there. I didn't know until much later that that was part of President Eisenhower's so-called Operation Wetback. The next thing that happened was in 1955 when in 1955 when there was a murder not far from here in Money, Mississippi, and Emmett Till was murdered. And of course, the papers in Los Angeles at that time, nor TV, carried it. But the mother of one of my close friends sat us all down and had us look at the Jet magazine, which is still being published. At that time, it was published on a weekly basis. And it was a main source of real news and information in addition to the other African-American newspapers in the African-American community. And she sat us down and showed us the picture of Emmett Till in the open coffin who had been tortured because he allegedly whistled at a white woman in Money, Mississippi, not far from here, and at some place that maybe uh, people here probably are familiar with. And that was our first experience dealing with what was going on in the South, you know, listening to my friend's mother tell us about their life in Mississippi before they moved to Los Angeles. Shortly after that, the Montgomery bus, bus boycott emerged, and that was a very positive thing. When Rosa Parks sat down, and we know now she sat down many times before she was arrested. And we also know that she was a, a union member, among other things, in Montgomery. But that inspired us, that gave, gave us hope. And so some of us became very interested in that neighborhood with what was going on in the South. And we recognized the same things were going on in California 
and Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, and so on. And so in 1960, I got involved with CSO. And the same time I went to work in the Los Angeles County Hospital, and if any of you had watched soap operas on television, especially the one that's called General Hospital, that's where I worked. And when I went to work there, workers were engaged in organizing a union there. And so I was working at night, I got involved in the union, and in the daytime I worked with CSO, which at that time was led by Cesar Chavez. By the mid the early 1960s, he insisted on organizing Latinos in the rural areas, in other words, farm workers in Central California and other places. And so he left that organization. And some of us followed him and followed him into that organization. And by 1965, there was a strike of workers in the grapes in the vineyards beginning in Coachella was led by Filipino workers, and then in the Central Valley in San Joaquin, led by Latinos and other uh, workers. In other words, Mexican Americans and Chicanos at that, at that time. Because I was involved, uh, one of the leaders of the union, Gilbert Padilla, asked me if I could work, take some time off from work and, and help with the strike. And I took time off and I never went back to work. In the meantime, the workers of the hospital successfully organized, by the way, but I became involved heavily with the UFW in, the, in, the, in 1966, I ended up in Texas with, the, with a significant strike that took place that's, very, that's really not well documented. And those were farm workers in Starr County, in Rio Grande, from Rio Grande City and Roma, and other little communities on the border there that went on strike against the same agribusiness corporations, the same corporations that were running the, the um, agricultural industry in California. And that strike at the end failed because of two things. One, we couldn't get enough community support for, for the strike because it was so distant from the metropolitan areas in Texas. But the other, we had Hurricane Beulah that came through there and destroyed the uh, ranches that uh, we had gotten union contracts was actually with uh, Chicano or uh, Latino uh, owners of small ranches. But the bulk of the ranches there were owned by agribusiness corporations. And if any of you are from Texas and you've heard of Othel Brand, who was for a long time mayor of McAllen, Texas, he was one of the growers and he was a first class racist in the, uh, in the, the best de uh, definition. And we had struggles through the 60s into the 70s and so on with him, but he had uh, thousands of acres and onions and other, other products at the time. Well, one thing that we did, because strike breakers were coming from Mexico, right across the river, we were right on the river, we organized a solidarity demonstration that was on both sides of the border with the help from the unions in Mexico who wanted to see us win, and workers from throughout the uh, Rio Grande Valley that were involved with the uh, farm workers movement, we set up a picket line on this side of the border from Laredo all the way down to Reynosa. If you're familiar with the geography, you probably know about Laredo because all the latest reporting on drugs and murders and whatnot, um, all the way down to Reynosa in um, the state of Tamaulipas, union members in Mexico also picketed. And there was a wonderful thing that, that uh, workers in Mexico, tradition that they had that actually was law. And that is when you go out on strike, you put a red and black flag in front of the establishment you're on strike against. And it's literally, it was literally against the law to cross the picket line and break the strike. And the labor movement in Mexico up to that point had been relatively strong. On this side, of course, in Texas, it's like Mississippi, it didn't have a very strong labor movement. But nevertheless, we, we set up the picket line and basically closed the border to strike breakers than anybody else who wanted to cross. So the governor at that time, John Connolly, called out the uh, Texas Rangers on us. And on this side, we were attacked and beaten and jailed and all of that. On the other side, uh, the National Guard was called up because local law enforcement didn't want to confront the uh, Mexican Union uh, members. And so the, the, the National Guard from Mexico, who you hear about nowadays running around with masks and shooting people in Mexico, they're the ones that um, really 
put fear into the union people and, and disperse the picket line. But that was one of the more significant solidarity efforts on the part of people from two countries up to that point. And there have been other actions uh, since then. But later on, as the struggle continued, you probably, some of you heard of the great boycott and the lettuce boycott and all of that. And that became an effort to support the uh, goals of the strike in California and elsewhere to put pressure on the growers to come to the bargain bargaining table to negotiate with the workers. And the boycott was organized in the urban areas all over the United States. And it put a tremendous amount of pressure over maybe four or five years period of time. And because people stopped eating grapes, and even in Texas, people stopped eating grapes to the, the, the extent that um, grapes in some places were being given away when they go to the urban areas. In some cities like Chicago, uh, jewel food stores and others refused to buy them after we harassed them to death with picket lines in Chicago. We had tremendous support on the south side from what was that uh, at that time was called Operation Breadbasket that was led by uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. We had support from uh, various community organizations on the south side, so you couldn't find a grape anywhere in the south side of Chicago. On the north side, there were coalitions. There was a, one of the original rainbow coalitions was on the north side. They got totally into the community and they, they stopped grapes. And if you went from city to city, you had this tremendous coalition that existed that made that boycott successful and brought the growers to the bargaining table. From that experience, I went on to organize healthcare workers in the South and public workers in the South. And as workers organized, many times like healthcare workers were isolated in their, in their uh, hospitals and they were very divided up. If you look at a hospital, you see all kinds of different departments and so on. But in South Carolina and in Georgia, hospital workers and nursing home workers wanted to organize. And so they put, they began organizing committees and reaching out through all the departments in their hospital. And then they began reaching out to the pastors of their churches and other community organizations, other unions like letter carriers, postal workers, others got involved in, in South Carolina and were able to successfully help those workers organize in Sumter, South Carolina. And of course, earlier there was a struggle in Charleston in 1969 that some of us were involved with in those days, and they were able to get a union. After that, they basically swept through South Carolina and, North Carol and, and uh, Georgia, organizing nursing homes, and they organized over 30 nursing homes with tremendous community support from Atlanta and various other uh, parts of the um, uh, South where, there, where those workers were organizing. In Texas, state employees began organizing and they took the approach that the people that they served as public servants were an important part of their effort to organize. So they reached out to the clients that the eligibility workers, the social workers, the health department workers uh, served, reached out to the organizations, the welfare rights groups and so on, and built a coalition during the 80s that was very successful in organizing that, that union. Other public workers in states like Texas and the South where you had right to work laws and their pro public workers were prohibited from striking saw the, the uh, successes in Texas and they wanted to organize also in Oklahoma, in Missouri, in um, North Carolina, and of course here in Mississippi. And so 22 years ago, I came up here from Texas to organize public workers and there, the state employees, the Mississippi Alliance of State Employees was very successful in defeating efforts to privatize uh, Parchman and the other prison facilities here. And the, the efforts on the part of the um, um, right wing elements in, in the state government to privatize the Department of Human Services. They also succeeded in building enough pay raises so that the minimum that was achieved over the decade of the 90s was $9,000 minimum 
uh, pay raises that those workers were able to get. But again, they couldn't do it by themselves. They did it together with client organizations and, and support from uh, their communities that they lived in. They organized all around the state and were able to put pressure on legislators who made the decisions about their pay, about their working conditions, their health care and benefits, and, and pushed the legislators into supporting many of their demands. Since then, we organized casino workers. I won't go into that because you're waving that at me. But uh, what has happened out of the casino campaign, the casino workers campaign, there were a number of undocumented workers that were working under contract in the casinos and they were being abused. And so we got a group of people together that cared about what was happening to immigrant workers and cared about what was happening to their children to form the Mississippi Immigrant Rights Alliance. And it was a combination of community organizations, civil rights organizations, and uh, religious groups that came together that started that. And we recognize that here in Mississippi, the name of the game is power just like it is anywhere else. And the demographics in Mississippi are divided between 37 to 40% African American, and prior to about 15, 20 years ago, the rest of the population was white. And I can say that when I came up here from Texas, I was looking for Mexican restaurants and Asian restaurants that I was used to in Texas, and I couldn't find but two, uh, two Latino restaurants and two Asian restaurants. But one thing that happened in 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement was negotiated, and it was negotiated at the advantage of the United States corporations to the disadvantage of particularly of Mexicans. And what happened after 1994, and some of you might remember the Zapatistas in, in Chiapas that were protesting NAFTA, the United States was able to mass market subsidized corn in the United States at below market prices in Mexico and drove over three million small farmers off the land almost overnight. In three, four years, that was the number of people that lost their ability to grow and sell their agricultural products because U.S. corporations were undermining it. It was deliberate. It was meant to push the people from the rural areas of Mexico into the urban areas and up to the border where the um, factories were, the maquiladoras that we call, that, that were American-owned factories that exploited Mexican labor to produce various things from assembling clothes to electronic parts to car parts to whatever. And the idea was to push them into the urban areas and, and depopulate the rural areas of Mexico. But in the meantime, China and other Asian countries became more attractive to U.S. corporations, so they started moving away uh, from the border areas, and there were no jobs for the people that were driven off the land. So almost simultaneously in the early 1990s, and particularly after 1994, we saw a surge of immigration out of Mexico into Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. I remember when I lived in Atlanta, there were only two Mexican restaurants, and you couldn't find a brown person, you know, no matter where you were at. But, you know, we had a march there. We expected, uh, in 2003, we had a march there and expected maybe five or 600 people to show up who were, who were immigrants. And actually, over 5,000 people showed up and ended up at a rally where uh, Dr. Joseph Lowry and other leaders in Atlanta uh, spoke. So you can see what had happened. In Mississippi, after, the, after NAFTA, we started seeing more and more Latinos coming here. So that presented the situation that we were in when we organized MIRA, and that was the demographics. 37 to 40% of the population is African American. The rest of the population up to that point was white. White people in this state find it very difficult to vote for a black person running for a statewide office. And Willie Simmons, a state senator from here who represents uh, part of Cleveland, had a cousin, Barbara Blackman, who ran for lieutenant governor some years back. And of course, about 10, 10 to 15 percent of white people voted for her. And of course, the vast majority of, of uh, uh, African Americans voted for her. But enter the Latino population. And this has what we saw 
was that Latinos coming into Mississippi, becoming citizens, their kids born here, uh, aging up into uh, voters and so on, the combination of progressive whites or whites that will vote for an African-American and African-Americans and then Latinos, at some point, probably in the next 10 years, the state could become a majority people of color state. And that could mean a significant change in the political dynamics in this state. Well, we saw that, and our organization is basically led by half African-American or African immigrant and half Latino and uh, Latino uh, native born and, and immigrants. And the idea is to put the coalition together so that a significant change could be made politically here in Mississippi. But the other side saw that, and if you look at the anti-immigrant bills that are introduced and have been passed in South Carolina, and in Georgia and in Alabama, all of them have language saying that they want to push immigrants into what they call self-deportation. In other words, make life so miserable for Latinos in, in these states that they'll leave. And the intent isn't because they're illegal, which we see as a very racist term, but their intent is to prevent the change that they know is coming and that they want to prevent from happening here in, the, in this state. And we have fought over, uh, fought successfully killed because of the coalition we have in Mississippi, basically led in the legislature by the Mississippi Legislative Black Caucus. Um, we've, been kill, we've killed over 250 bills over the last 10 years that have been introduced to make life miserable for immigrants in the state, and in addition to that, for workers, regardless of their immigrant status. And that coalition is very important. And last, this past legislative session is the first time Republicans have been in control of both sides of the legislature. And so finally, other groups that had their self-interest involved, the Farm Bureau, which in my life has been an enemy, but suddenly became an ally, the Poultry Growers Association and so on, along with the unions and churches and so on, were able to come together and create the atmosphere that uh, allowed the, the latest bill to be killed. But we're already engaged now to fight uh, bad bills um, that are coming up in January. And this week, the um, Joint Legislative Budget Committee began having hearings on the budgets for state agencies, including the possibility of money being set aside for the purpose of arresting and incarcerating immigrants. So I don't have much time. There's a lot going on, and I'll save it. You know, we've, we've dealt with the riot and so-called riot, which we see as a protest in Natchez, which you may be curious about, among many other things. So, and I wanted to show you this handout here. If you read the whole thing, you'll get an understanding of immigration. And I think his brother was talking about books on the back here. We have a list of books that we highly recommend, and I, I would like to add yours to our list, by the way you know, of uh, books um, on um, the African-American struggle in Mississippi, the migration and immigrant workers and Latino history, and then organizing. Because all of this comes about by organizing face-to-face. -face. People don't get involved. We think that maybe uh, using the um, uh, social media and so on that we can really build something but there's no substitute from, you know, for face-to-face -face organizing. I talked to a preacher, I talked to a union leader, I talked to my brother over here to get them involved, and that's what it takes to do it. And that's what we've got to do, is to understand that it takes understanding the people that we're trying to get to support us, or the people that we're get, trying to get that share the same interests that we have to get involved. It starts with one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. I, uh, the reason uh, I didn't want the gentlemen to walk out because they really don't know how serious uh, what we're talking about. The lady who sung for us talked about three people who intentionally gave their lives for all of us. 
Cheney, Goodman, and Sherman. Cheney was a thug. Uh, Schwerner and Goodman were two Jewish boys who should have kept their ass in New York. <laughs> but they came to Mississippi and Schwerner gave up his thug life to get in the movement. Schwerner and Goodman were shot behind the ear, gangster style. Really, she's upset because she was torn apart by two tractors, one going the other direction, and the other going the other direction. <sighs> Why? Because he's supposed to be a thug and stay a thug. And the reason I wanted to come to this activity, I think this is Paul's fifth activity about Mississippi, I want to talk about the context of Fanny Bohemian because she was not supposed to be what she proposed to come because she was a daughter of a shared property. Now, this is what year is it? 2012? Do anybody still remember what who shared properties were? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know sometimes. You know, sometimes the grandchildren weren't told what was going on. Because share properties were nothing but a form of slaves. Where uh, their produce was uh, brought by their uh, the owner to the market. And then he says, this is your share. And you were not supposed to complain, right? So you were part of the underclass. And you were not to criticize your status. And this still relates today, because we have an underclass in our schools. You know, your principal and your teacher's gonna get your one percent and educate them. They're going to get scholarships at the University of Mississippi, Mississippi State, Mississippi State, and all that. But their majority will be just like Van Wilhelm, just like James Cheney, and we expect to be part of the underclass and therefore be tracked into the what? The new Jim Crow, and you need to get that book. It's about the new Jim Crow, about the privatized prison industry. So they really don't want to educate all your children. I wanted to talk real to you about what was going on here in Mississippi and why Mississippi was so important. I worked for the Southern Regional Council which is the organization of good liberal white folks and good bourgeoisie black folks that had dialogue with each other. You know, they talk about things uh, that was born in the parties and didn't do much. But things begin to happen in the world. Paul, Paul Robeson, who was a communist, a black man, senior, uh, toured Europe and told, and told Europe that black people were no longer fighting for America if there's another war. America was in a trauma about communism. So things begin to change in the parties. There is a book and I want all of you to understand that when you were in a college and everything, you were given a syllabus which the professor has to turn into the department head, and you're supposed to uh, repeat what he teaches you, uh, and then you move on. But that's not the end of life. You need to question 
what is going on in your syllabus. You need to go, you need to read other things. You need to continue to read the rest of your life. The truth is always being formed. So one book that I was uh, given to read when I was in school was called Southern Casting Class in Southern Town by John Dollar. It's about a town in the Delta, about race relations. And it's about uh, a, stu it's a study, a psychological study of how culture determines personality. Now this was very important to psychologists in the 30s because these uh, psychologists, many of them, wanted to understand what the hell happened to this little educated German people to get brainwashed by this Hitler? So they begin to realize that psychologically we do things not necessarily based upon reason, but by how we are psychologically manipulated, how we are deceived, how we are so turned around that's against our own self-interest. And this is serious, my friends, because uh, Germany was only a few weeks away from knowing how to do that atomic bomb. They were in the contest with America, and soon America found out, you know, what happened with it. So that's why there is such a big scare today about the uh, Iranians learning how to do the atomic bomb. But as I see it, I wish my friends didn't walk out because they and their grandchildren are, are in trouble. Because, you know, you can't stop people learning how to be stupid. <laughs> And so that's why what happened in Germany, what happened during the movement, is still continuing. Now, Fannie Lou Hamer was very dangerous to the system. I told you I worked for the Southern Region Council. A study was, um, um, was developed called the American Dilemma. Has anybody here remember reading the American Dilemma? Now, who was that supported by? What foundation supported that? Can anybody tell me what foundation that was? Andrew who? Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, after he stole all them billions of dollars, got rid of it, <laughs> and decided he would distribute his wealth that would promote uh, values and goodness of America and all that. And they, uh, this study, determined that America was in trouble domestically it, unless it changed and destroyed Jim Crow. Because Jim Crow was the system that succeeded as you know, uh, slavery and segregation. We must assimilate the black folks into American society. Notice I didn't use the word integrate. I said assimilate, that's the difference. Integrate means maintaining your culture and working together for the greater whole, right? Assimilating means getting rid of all your cultural differences and becoming one. And of course, what did the Republican Party do at this national convention? Decided to cut out multicultural education programs in the public school system. Uh, American and Mexican children should not learn that America stole one million acres from Mexico. We don't need to teach that, do we? <laughs> that they came to California, Nevada, and all that. And we, don't, we don't need to teach that, do we? So that's why I'm saying something you better start learning yourself. And as I told my uh, uh, some uh, members of the AB Church in Quincy, Florida, uh, just what, two Sundays ago? If you call yourself African Methodist Episcopal Church, well, you ought to have an Afrocentric program, you know, to teach your children. You can't expect the school system to do that. <laughs> so, I mean, the Jewish community do that with their children. No, they started programming. So we're in 
serious manure. We need to understand what is going on. Now, why was Fanny Lou Hamer so dangerous? The reason I got all these papers thrown out, I appreciate what you said about Brother Cox, uh, the minister. Uh, was, when I was an attorney uh, uh, for the Southern Union Council, I would stand outside the church with two uh, FBI agents. Uh, they wouldn't talk to me, and I wouldn't talk to them because we just observe, right? And uh, Reverend Cox would talk, do his talk, and then the people would come out of the church during Freedom Day, marching, to, trying to march to the courthouse there in Madison County, Canton. It's, it's Madison County, it's Canton City, uh, Madison County. That way it goes? Okay. And of course, there'd be a line of uh, deputy troopers with their red nigger sticks, and uh, they beat up on the heads of the uh, people coming out of the church. And that's I begin to realize there must be something to this religion. <laughs> well, that didn't make a bit of sense to me. But this is what black people did in Mississippi. What was taking place was called a Freedom Day. That was all part of the Freedom Summer program. And uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was part of that. They had the Freedom Day uh, demonstration, put all these papers out here. Uh, they had uh, what was called uh, the Freedom Schools. The Freedom Schools was a very important program. It was an alternative program done by the state and core workers in Mississippi, whereby they developed young people to be critical thinkers. Why am I here? What is Mississippi? What should I learn from the, the major culture? What should I keep from my own culture? These are questions that they need to answer for themselves and develop for themselves. I really believe we still need a freedom school process in our community. Yeah. Of course, the other was the Freedom of Southern Theater and the Freedom Democratic Party. And that's where Fannie Lou Haber, as you know, became famous. In the state of Mississippi, and I hate to say it, I think it was a, a black uh, uh, senator during the Reconstruction that supported the resolution. Am I right, Ms. Simmons? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh you, you, you grooving on what you're writing. I'm no, no, I'm writing what you're saying, but I don't know which resolution. But this is, this is a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution of the state of Mississippi. In order to be registered to vote, you have to interpret the Constitution mm -hmm. to the satisfaction mm -hmm. of the supervisor of election. That was I.T. Montgomery, who was a delegate after Mississippi. Well, what was his name again? I.T. Montgomery. Montgomery. Yeah, he was a delegate at the Constitutional Convention in 1890 in Mississippi, and he supported the franchise before he was on that franchise. Isaiah Montgomery. I'm going to come back to that. But because of what he did, as you know, you can have a doctorate from Alcorn or Jackson State in political science, but would never satisfy the supervisor of election that you know how to interpret Constitution of the state of Mississippi. This was intentional. Now, you can, you can look at the good side and the bad side. The good side is why we want to keep the liberal people from uh, registering the vote. Anyway, that, that seemed to be the good thing. But you know what the real purpose was? To keep the majority of the population of the state of Mississippi from registering the vote. So the purpose of the of the freedom ballot program that took place before 1964 was to have a mock election of Anne Henry to show America that if, if black people could be registered to vote, 90,000 people could be able to vote. So that was one of the activities of uh, 
of Freedom Summer leading to the Freedom Democratic Party. Now, the reason the Freedom Democratic Party was important because you're supposed to be loyal to the Democratic Party and its uh, resolutions. Uh, and of course, the state of Mississippi was opposed to uh, being required to support the positions of a national Democratic Party. So, as an alternative, we organized a Freedom Democratic Party in all these counties in the state of Mississippi and sent an alternative delegation uh, to the convention to be recognized. And of course, you know that story. Um, the Freedom Democratic Party was not really recognized as the legitimate Democratic Party, but was able, they said, we'll give you two people as alternative uh, delegates, and of course, uh, Van Lou Hamer obtained national support from many of the delegates, and the serious hatred of President Johnson, which will have consequences that needs to be studied by one of your students who are interested in the story of Van Lou Hamer because uh, when she came back to Mississippi and started community organizing, the federal government began to sabotage everything she did. Now let's, let's talk about sabotage. But I, I said I was gonna talk about Isaiah Montgomery once again. Mm -hmm. Isaiah uh, Montgomery had a father. What was his name? Benjamin Montgomery. And this is, very important to understand the critical role of the state of Mississippi in relation to the freedom movement and the Civil War. Jefferson Davis, you know about it, right? But you don't know too much about his brother. And they both own 10,000 acres of cotton land called ben, uh, Davis Bend. I think it's now part of the Louisiana because I think the Mississippi River had <coughs> cut it off. Now, his brother had a brilliant idea. His idea was to go to England and study the Rochdale Cooperative Movement and come back to Mississippi and instead of uh, the slaves being slaves, they would enter into a contract and be a cooperative movement. Now that sounds like a pretty good idea. Just, just imagine if there was more time to work that out. Because it was important for Mississippi to have this industry, this cotton industry from the Delta, because this is the richest land you know, in America. However, you need to have relationships between management and labor. That, that's relevant instead of a slave system. Even Henry Ford found this out and he began to pay his workers good wages in the beginning of the 20th century because he felt if they had more money, they'd buy his cars. So that's important to increase the income of your workers. But unfortunately, Passions did not, not allow that happen. There was a civil war, but Isaiah Montgomery still had a connection with all of these workers that was part of the Davis Plantation. And even after the civil war, they had an organization. They had a unity as a community. How far is my mom the value from here? 15 miles? 60 miles? He formed that community with money from who? Jefferson Davis. And had a very good relationship with the Booker T. Washington. I have this book because when I was growing up in segregated schools, Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington was a necessary book. You, you have one too? Yeah, you better read it. 
But what I'm trying to say, there was a very serious rupture in the movement, moving to a good conclusion. And that is the need for America to have a underclass and lower class. Fannie Lou Hamer was part of the underclass that could not be permitted to move forward. And because of her insulting the President of the United States, that was the excuse. So there was all of these dynamics that occurred in the rest of her life and trying to organize in the Delta, which was sabotaged by the federal government, such as the uh, Friends of Mississippi uh, Head Start Program. Uh, I'm in Florida, and every time I try to organize community action agencies, in the northern Florida, the governor would have his black monkey follow me and talk to the uh, power structure and say, now, if you don't cooperate, uh, you will have something like they have in Mississippi. You know, and that, that's how all those uh, anti-party programs got to be created in uh, North Florida. And some of my good ministers, you know, went along with the program. You know how that goes. But this should show you that Fannie Lou Hamer could not be permitted to function as she had to do. She was very much involved in trying to organize the farmers, uh, farming tenant unions, and, and other activities. And hopefully, uh, you and I can cooperate and keep studying who this Fannie Lou Hamer is. I'm going to give you my email address so we can continue a dialogue. It's the uh, John Do Law Review. John Do Law Review at gmail.com. We have to find some way to overcome this class problem that's gone beyond just black and white, but class and underclass. Otherwise, we are not going to have a future for my great-grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's getting late, so I'll try to shorten my uh, talk a little bit. Uh, I'm Margaret Kibbe. I came here for from San Francisco. I couldn't afford to come in 64, so I saved my money and came in 65. And I was just here for the summer to work on, uh, to work in freedom schools, and I wound up staying here for the rest of my life and uh, working on voter registration. And Otis Jr. was my project director, and he had a lot to do with my staying here. But anyway, uh, we worked on voter registration, voter registration, and voter registration. And we understood the importance, if you get people registered to vote so that they play a part in elections, things will change. And they did, eventually, although not very quickly. Um, and I will say briefly, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and the important lessons that it gives us today. And something that Mrs. Hamer told me that stuck with me and why she was important and important to us today she was talking about the first time she went to try to register to vote and all these men were around with dogs and making this big deal and she said right then she knew that there was something to this. And that was the thing that strikes me about the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. We were dealing with people who had been kicked out of high school or who did not have college educations. Uh, a lot of people who were you know, hard workers in the movement they didn't have very much education. And we worked under the Ella Baker philosophy. You don't waste time with the middle class and the upper middle class. You go to the poor streets. You go to the underclass sections. And those are the people who would work with you and cooperate with you because they didn't have much to lose. Now, there'd be some middle class people who would come in and join the movement. But basically, you were working with the poor people, and they would stick with you. And 
But yet, despite this, the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement was what I call a cerebral movement. We weren't just all about demonstrating and marching. We were political organizing. We were planning and we were organizing. And the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in Indianola at the time had these block organizations. They would meet in a block every, uh, every week and you get up to date on who was registered to vote, who was not, and certain important things that were going on, such as the challenge to the, the Mississippi congressman, and different other important events that were happening. Then you would have your citywide meetings, your citywide mass meetings, which were kind of hard to hold in Indianola because we had no place to hold them after the Freedom School burned. And, but we would have county meetings in other parts of Sunflower County, and you would have countywide meetings. And this basic organization had a lot to do with what the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was able to do with almost nothing. The, it was true that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was not seated at the 1964 convention, but they made changes and differences that the Democratic Party was never the same. That was the last time that a segregated delegation was seated, and after that it had to be split by race and sex. So I participated in the 68 convention myself, not in the national convention, just through the state through Sunflower County and on to, uh, the, to the state of Mississippi. And at that time, that they seated the Mississippi Loyalist and the Democratic Party changed, which of course now the Democratic Party is black and the Republican Party, which didn't exist, is white and it now has taken over the legislature. But anyway, uh, the Democratic Party is completely changed because of the things that the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement did. And I just want to mention that that is an important legacy of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And I myself, uh, one of the things that was striking to me is how people in Mississippi didn't have any money. And when I say no money, I mean no money. And I had started going down with people to the welfare department to talk to the welfare workers to try to help people get the benefits that they were supposed to get. And back in those days, the state of Mississippi paid a disability check of $30 a month if you qualified as totally and permanently disabled. And while that sounds kind of rough, it really wasn't because all you really needed was a statement from a doctor that you were totally and permanently disabled. You get it. Uh, that is not true now. But I wound up working for a legal services program and for years, and I'm still doing this on my own as a self-employed person that I represented people before the administrative law judges to help them get their disability benefits, and that's what I still do. But um, that, that's another thing, too, that back then when I started working for legal services, all the lawyers, except for one, were white. And of course, now that's not true anymore. And now here in the Delta, the majority of the judges are black. Uh, so we've, we've seen a lot of changes, and a lot of these changes are substantial changes that were started in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement here in the Delta. Is this on? Can you hear me? Because I tend to talk very loudly anyway since I teach, and I'm drowning out students who try not to pay me any attention. So I'm, I'm quite accustomed to speaking loudly. First of all, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And for you students, particularly who have stayed, uh, I really, really appreciate this because this is a work night, and I realize that you probably have lots to do. So thank you so much for staying. I too am going to uh, abbreviate my comments. Uh, I noticed that often this is what women do. Men will not. <laughs> now, I'm very pleased that I knew uh, and worked with Fannie Lou Hamer. Mississippi as a a uh, person who had just finished my second year in college, 
Uh, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, born and raised, and I had been taught all my life that Mississippi was a very dangerous place. Now, I was right up the road there in Memphis, but my grandmother had taught me that if you think Memphis is bad, don't even think about going to Mississippi. So, of course, when she learned that I had been sneaking around, getting involved in the civil rights movement when she had sent me off to school to get an education, the first person in my family to graduate from high school and certainly to, to go off to Spelman, which uh, uh, black people in Memphis and other places really looked up to this. So she could not believe that I was going to give that up to go to Mississippi and work. Nonetheless, I did against her wishes and basically she never forgave me for it, by the way. But um, anyway, uh, meeting someone like a Mrs. Hamer, as I did, uh, certainly helped me to feel that I had made the right decision uh, about coming here. I was in Laurel, Mississippi, and I worked, uh, I went down for the Mississippi Freedom Summer, planning just to be there for the summer and then to return to college and I wound up staying 18 months uh, as the project director in Laurel. So I just wanted to say that to give you some background on, on myself, um, but the real thing I want to talk about is Mrs. Hamer, but I also want to contextualize Ms. Hamer in terms of the role of black women in the civil rights movement as well as before. Um, I think that hopefully, and I don't know if you are learning about the civil rights movement in any of your classes. Uh, I teach at UF, as you've heard, we've got over 50,000 students there, and I'll do real good if I can get 10 in a civil rights class. Uh, it is a disgrace. Uh, it is outrageous that the civil rights movement is not being taught to students in this country. Yet the South became a part of the rest of this country because of the civil rights movement. I mean, this, you kids don't have any idea what it was like in Ms. Hamer's time, my time when I came here. I mean, this was, as a, a hellhole for black people. So um, I'm not assuming that you know about the role of black women in the civil rights movement, but I'm here to tell you that they were the backbone of that movement. Um, I, I seriously doubt if it would have been as successful as it was, and it was successful. It was one of the most successful social change movements that has ever occurred in this country. And if you haven't taken any classes, if your school isn't offering any, demand that they do. This is American history, and it is very important. Um, I was really blessed to work with not only Ms. Hamer, there were other women uh, like Annie Devine, uh, Unita Blackwell, uh, over in Laurel I worked with Uberta Spinks. These are people many of you will never hear of unless some of us who worked with them call their names and make sure that you learn about them. Um, but the role that African American women played in the civil rights movement was not the beginning of our activism. The, the die for us had been cast during the slavery period and thereafter. For African American women had always had to exert leadership in our centuries long fight to end slavery 
oppression, and racism. African American women have been in the forefront of all the black struggles that this group has waged in this country to end racism, economic exploitation, and discrimination in every area of life. And guys, I'm here to tell you the fight is not over. If you're not paying attention to what's going on, you better get it. You better find out because there are people who are trying to roll back everything we fought for. They're even trying to take the vote away from us right now. It, this is dangerous times, guys. Very dangerous. Uh, Mrs. Hayman is one of the African-American heroes, heroines, of our long struggle in this country for justice and equality. Uh, there are people in this room, some at this table, who know Ms. Hamer better than I. I saw her from afar. She was an icon. She was someone I looked up to. I didn't get to know her personally because I was on the other side of the state working. But when I would go to meetings of the uh, SNCC staff meetings, particularly after we had organized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, she was a force to be reckoned with. And just like my brother John was saying, she wasn't supposed to be that way. She was someone who started picking cotton when she was six years old. They had no intention for her to become literate, to become politically literate, uh, and to lead any movements. So this is why she was such a dangerous person uh, to this country. Um, I hope some of you know that she was born in Montgomery County, Mississippi in 1917, the same year my father was born. And she was the youngest of 20 children. Her family moved to Sunflower County, Mississippi when she was two, and as I've said, she had to start picking cotton when she was six years old. Um, the thing that I want you to know about Ms. Hamer was, is rather that here is a person that the society had victimized all of her life. Her family had been victimized, but she was no victim. She was a fighter. She just needed a spark to get her going. And once that spark came in the form of some civil rights workers, she was off and running. And she suffered mightily for her beliefs. She was beaten so badly uh, that she almost died. She, you know, it took her years to get, she really never got over it the beating that she received for attempting to register to vote. And anybody in this room who is old enough to vote and you are not registered to vote, please go tomorrow and do that. I mean, people like Ms. Hamer really gave their lives because her life was shortened because of the beating she sustained for her effort. Many of us were beaten we were dragged, we were jailed to get the right to vote. Let me tell you, don't take it lightly. The right wing has the money, but we have the vote. And if we use it, we can overcome the plan they have for us. If you're a black male in this room, the, plan, the fact that you're in this room means you've already escaped the plan that they had for you, which was for you to be in prison. You're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be here. So you've already done that, and thank God, and I congratulate you. But let me tell you, they've got definite plans for all of us. It used to just be for black people, but it's for all people now who are not in the 1%. So please, Ms. Hamer is a heroine to every one of us in this room, and you need to learn her story and the story of all these women and men who 
fought for you to be in this room today because you couldn't have been in here if you're black, brown, or yellow, if it hadn't been for Ms. Hamer and all the other Mrs. Hamers and Mr. Hamers that fought and died to get you here. So these are the lessons you have to learn because when you don't learn your history, you are forced to repeat it. And people have plans to put us all back on the plantation. Right I'm now. not talking about a literal plantation. Right now. But, you know, the Walmart plantation. Uh, you know, selling hamburgers plantation. I mean, not making enough money to live a decent life plantation. This is what Romney, Ryan, this is what they have in mind and the people that they represent. Thank you, friends, for being here. Tonight, I want to accomplish two things. I want to tell you things of that era, and I want to prove to Ms. Simmons that a man can give a short, non-rambling speech. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. Um, <coughs> a lot has been said about Mississippi, and a lot of blame is placed on Mississippi. But I can tell you about San Francisco at that time. Liberal San Francisco, where I grew up. Before coming to Mississippi myself, I learned about the struggle because we were picketing Auto Row, big Auto Row in San Francisco, Calpa, Cadillac, Buick, etc., because they did not have one person of color in their employment. We picketed hotels in San Francisco, liberal San Francisco the Sheridan Palace Hotel where the president would stay. No people of color were employed, not chambermaids, not cooks, not anyone. It was an all-white ordeal in San Francisco of that era. Our schools were integrated. I went to a high school where there were 3,000 students. There were 11 black students and a handful of Chicano students and some Asian, but essentially the people of color represented less than 3% of the whole school. Other schools in San Francisco were black schools with a few white people, were Asian schools with a few mixed, were all segregated because San Francisco, my city, our neighborhoods were segregated areas and the school districts were gerrymandered to serve that community. So I, even though growing up in California, I grew up in a segregated educational system. Jobs, housing, everything was segregated in the liberal West. While I was in Mississippi in the election, when uh, Johnson beat, beat Goldwater, in California they had an election and they passed by 63% margin Proposition 14, which was put up by the real estate industry that specifically said you may refuse to sell your home to a person of color. Liberal. That, and, and it was passed in California. Now, fortunately, within a year and a half, the uh, state Supreme Court threw it out. But I came from a segregated place to work in a segregated place. And that was Mississippi. Um, we came down from Oxford, came in, we we took charter buses from Oxford, Ohio, where we had our orientation. In Memphis, we got into Greyhound buses and came down, and I got off in Ruleville with the other workers. And my first impression of Mississippi was a white couple drove up, and the lady had her hairs in gaudy curls, and she greeted me, looking at me, giving me the one finger peace sign. 
and that was my first. And which was even worse is she looked like so many of my relatives. <laughs> my second impression, we crossed the road and walked a half a block and we arrived at Mrs. Hamer's house. And she had uh, flowers in her garden and she greeted us warmly with drinks. And I got to know that woman in my year here. I have heard a philosopher say that there are no extraordinary people, there are ordinary people who do extraordinary things. That philosopher had not met Mrs. Hamer <laughs> because she was a common person of common stock that was extraordinary. And she went on to do extraordinary things. She suffered horrendously, discrimination, violence, but she kept her eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have done it myself. I would have buckled under. She went through hell that we don't know and stayed focused and had God not given us Mrs. Hamer, the movement would have occurred, but it would not have occurred as fast and as righteously because we would not have had her. She was the embodiment of the movement. I hear from youth today, some justifiable things are horrible. They're worse than they were then. No, they are not worse than they were then. They are not as horrible as they were then. They are not as good as we would like them to be. And what we want them to be really is up to you youth today. That's right. And a point of optimism that I've had here these few days that I've met young people from Florida and they're doing the essential thing. They are organizing into a group. They've chosen a nice old wise fellow to oh. advise them. And they are, oh, a nice wise fellow. Right. <laughs> They are being directional and they are looking for change. And that's the only thing that is going to do it. To organize as the unions organized in the old days. Right. To organize as the civil rights workers organized in that time and made change. It wasn't easy and it took a long time. Also in my optimism, my son in San Francisco, he's a fireman. He's of African descent. Not until 1981 did the liberal city of San Francisco allow any people of color into the fire department. 1981, not 1964, 1981 when, when that was broken. Up to that time, shamefully, they were all white. They were either of Italian descent or Irish descent, and they all had to be Roman Catholic. That was a locked up club. Today, my son is a lieutenant. He is in ninth place to become a captain, and he's living happily ever after. My other son is of Mexican descent, and he is a nurse at uh, University of California, San Francisco. He, no one questions a thing about his color. He went into a medical profession, into the medical industry, which for years and years and years was held in the hands of the white people. Today, he works on the floor, and it's the United Nations on that floor that is employed there. That makes me very happy and optimistic. And my daughter, who also is of Mexican descent, she's 24 years of age. It is not within her mentality that she cannot go out and do whatever she wishes to do as long as she's qualified. Being a woman, being of Mexican descent, this doesn't enter her head. All she realizes is, I am an American and I can go there and do that. And of course, I'm filled with love of my children. I'm filled with optimism of what can happen. Going back to my original point, 
It all depends on you citizens, and especially you young people, to look around, and you don't have to look far for what has to be changed. Ten of you, ten of you can do great things, and a hundred monumental, and a thousand can change the world as we did in 1964. And I wish you all Questions uh, for distinguished panelists? Sure. If there's some questions. Oh. There's something I wanted to say. I want to personally thank all of you for coming here today and for doing what you've done because your sacrifices, you risking your life, have given us a better country than you inherited. More opportunities, more chances, and I'm immensely grateful. I was very impressed with the women from Parchment some years ago when they changed the shifts from three uh, eight-hour shifts to two 12-hour shifts, and it disrupted so many uh, women's lives with their children and so on. And we had a um, union meeting with about 200 uh, mostly women, but some men from Parchment, all African-American. And the meeting was to file a grievance against the um, management of Parchment, or correction. And we had to fill out individual grievance forms, you know, in order to push the grievance. You probably remember that. And what was I was impressed with was the discussion we had over four hours. And if you close your eyes, you would have thought we were in American Civil Liberties Union meeting because they're talking about the horrible conditions at Parchment and what was happening to youth who were, in, who were incarcerated at their age and you know everything you can think about that's wrong with prison. But now it's even worse that the private prison industry has entered into uh, prison and the protest in Natchez at, at the Adams County Correctional Facility you know, is just the tip of the iceberg of what is happening to not only immigrants but other real victims of corporate um. Professor, if I might, I'd like to um, ask one of the students here, any one of you, uh, what realistically do you see the student? And by student, I don't, you can be high school, you can be college, or you can just be a person of student age. Uh, what is the role that you see realistically that the student plays today? Uh, as a part of carrying on any kind of movement for social justice and change. Uh, I'll say something. Mm -hmm. I personally think the um, term activist means being active. And I feel that uh, we can do our um, workshops as youth and um, we can talk about things that happen, we can do interviews. I think until we actually go out, because I feel that what we're doing is very minuscule compared to what you guys did um, back then. So I think if we all get together and think about what we can do actively to make a change, then that would really be a bigger difference. But as for right now, I feel like it's only very a small percentage of what we could be doing. So I think uh, we should be able to get more involved. So I feel like, of course, the people who care about it are going to be involved. That's only maybe 10% of the youth today. So by reaching that other 90%, I think that we can come together and think about things that we could do in the future to, you know, not, it will never compare to what you guys did, but just to show you that we're working forward and that, you know, when your generation is no longer that, 
it will still continue to, um, like you said, so it wouldn't be repeating. History won't repeat itself. So that's all right. Can I ask you a question? Uh, what can you do to talk to other youth who are in the third world, walking around with pants hanging down and all that, who are being marked for the prison industry? What can you do as a high achiever and communicate to these kids? Well, actually, um, it's funny you say that. We had um, an assembly at my school, um, I think it was last week, two weeks ago, maybe. Um, and it was um, an ex um, con who had came to the school, and um, he was a part of the gang world or whatever. And he came to the school to talk to kids and to relate to them on their level, to show them the differences between what he did back then and what they're doing now, so it won't repeat itself. So I think if we have people who have experienced that before to be real life examples as to, you know, the effect that it can have on your life by engaging in those kind of activities. Let me say too that uh, I don't, uh, I don't look at uh, what I've done, whatever it is, uh, in my years, and I was out in California for a while, uh, served on the city council in Berkeley. I lived in San Francisco when I first moved out there and couldn't find an apartment to rent in 1968. Uh, neither the Asians nor the whites would rent to us. Um, and I ended up in the East Bay. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I feel privileged, really. I feel that, that we were the gifted generation, that we had the chance to it was easy for us to get involved. I mean, there were other students, there was a cadre of people, there was a movement developing like I talked about in Greensboro. It's much tougher now, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for young people because you don't have that mass energy uh, out there. And, um, and we were heroes. Uh, and we've, uh, we've not, I mean, some have suffered, many have suffered, but the rewards for us um, spiritually and, and in, in many cases personally, uh, have, have matched, uh, have, have surpassed in many cases the sacrifices that we individually have made. So I don't think that we ought to be uh, looked upon uh, on any kind of elevated uh, statue. We're just, uh, as one said, just ordinary people uh, who were at an extraordinary time. Uh, and, and, and for me, it was a privilege to be at that time. So um, I, I, I feel for the challenge that this young generation faces to find relevance and to find a way to make a difference. Can I uh, uh, follow up on what you said? Uh, uh, I'm working on a theory that Captain Pritchett who was, uh, I mean, Chief Pritchett, who was Chief of the Police in Albany. I, I believe he had a meeting with Bobby Kennedy and said, you know, uh, we've been playing a game whereby they need us to be stupid so that they can organize. So instead of uh, fighting them, let's put them on the payroll. Let's, let's you know, control them that way. Yeah. And that's where we are today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have the white Ku Klux Klan looking for us anymore. They, you know, we didn't have that opposition to organize again. And we don't have the organization to organize against anymore. You know, it's all the corporate world that you don't see. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you guys for uh, coming. Um, it's a great experience being here. I have a question for you based upon the questions that you asked us. Um, um, can you give us any advice or your opinions on what this younger uh, new generation, what we can do in order to move forward or um, to do, to be active, to be activists or anything in today's world? Uh, my first um, response would that be to educate yourself about prior movements. Educate yourself about the civil rights movement, the labor movements of the 40s and the 30s. Educate yourself about those. And you can understand about community, community organizing. There's a lot of good books re written. Um, you could start out with Saul Alinsky, Revely for Radicals. You can read a lot, of, a lot of good books about the civil rights movement. I have a personal favorite with uh, Todd Moy's 
let the people decide because that's about Sunflower County. And I thought he did a real good job of, of uh, writing. Uh, but anyway, um, you educate yourself and learn about the movement. And then my personal advice at this time would be to, you can see problems and you can start dialogues. Now, I personally think the upcoming election is very, very important. And the, I think you have to have dialogues with people so they'll stop falling into these traps and just letting Fox News do your thinking for you and start talking to people and asking them some common sense things and start you know, having group discussions with other students who vote and or who should be voting and make sure everybody's uh, registered to vote. I don't agree with voter ID. I hope it gets thrown out by the courts. But to be on the safe side, help everybody get a voter ID. You know, have an ID, a state ID. Help, help them get one. Right. Um, you need it for other things. I have to have to laugh that sometimes, in some ways, the casinos have helped us with that because you can't redeem your points without a picture of ID, a state ID. But anyway, the um, help people who wouldn't otherwise have it get it, just in case think something comes up. Um, and that, that would be the first thing I would have dialogue to have people think rationally about upcoming elections and w the important role that they should play. Uh, I think that Obama has been held to, I know I shouldn't be talking politics, but Obama has been held to a much higher standard than any president I've ever seen. Um, talk about this. Uh, and then second, there are enough problems that you can pick one and go at it. I mean, we have the education systems in the Delta that have problems. And, but Mississippi has something that nobody else has. We have a law on the books where local school, state law, local schools are supposed to teach the civil rights movement in their area and to help do that curriculum and help that be done in your local schools, wherever you are, it would be a step in the right direction. And here in the Delta, we got some of the most interesting history, civil rights history that there is. Mm -hmm. uh, May I uh, recommend a book to other uh, young people to read? It's called Organizing from the Ground Up. Emily, Emily. Cosby is the editor of it, and that will teach you exactly what we did. It's called organizing from the ground up. And that's what I've been talking about ever since I've been traveling. I just want to talk about it. You don't have to have a college degree or nothing to get out there. That's what we did. We went into the communities and identified the people, and, and, and they told us their problems and made them the leaders, and we let them organize. So you can get a lot of insight to read that book. Well, I'd like to, to point out also that there's a list of books here and it's focused on organizing, particularly the ones at the bottom, examples, or, you know, or, or I'd like to add to one thing that um, Margaret was talking about, the voter ID. Now, our organization has been very active registering voters in areas where there's large Latino populations. And with older populations like in Scott County, which is uh, east of Jackson, there are youth there that, are, that were born in the United States and are citizens and are aging up to voting age, which is 18. Be, you know, if you're 18 before uh, election day, you can register to vote even though you may be 17 now. We're also focused on organizing African American youth uh, together with the Latinos in that county and New Newton County and others. But one of the things that we ran into with this voter ID thing is one, our Secretary of State, who is an avowed states writer, I mean, he says that in his literature and on his, in his website, if you go to Delbert Hoseman and look it up, he has got a poster that is very misleading that's in the courthouses now that is telling people in the poster that, you know, how to get an ID. And down at the bottom, in very fine, fine, uh, fine print, they said this is pending, um, you know, actually implement, implementing the voter ID. Now, the purpose of the voter ID is to disempower people. 
And another thing that they're doing is closing the Department of Public Safety offices where you get a driver's license or where you get a voter ID because of budget problems. So for example, in Scott County, there's no place to get a uh, ID. You have to go to Decatur to get that, which is 30 miles away. And a lot of people, particularly elderly people, may not be able to do that. But also other people will be intimidated. And this voter ID thing is very, you know, the very vicious, vicious first step to disenfranchise people and to oh, yeah. counter that the things that we all have been working on. I want to say one more thing. While I worked in Texas and California uh, in the period that you all were here in, in Mississippi, there's a lot of connections between us. Uh, you said you were in California in 1968, but one of your colleagues, Marshall Gans, uh, who was working in Ahmed County after the summer of 64, came and joined us in California and with Cesar Chavez conceived the idea of the boycott, which was basically an extension of what happened in Mississippi. And Hollis Watkins work, works with us um, and various other uh, people that have been active. Dave Dennis has been part of the, the uh, MIRA activities and so on. So there's a lot of um, uh, connections. We're all cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but one of the things, you know, we're all, you know, up in age, and we, all of us have been doing stuff for a long time, and a lot of us uh, have trouble keeping everything within 15 minutes and figuring out what we think that you need to, to know. So uh, we really appreciate your interest in, in uh, um, Dr. Ortiz and the others here, you know, for, for making this happen. I think we need to do more of it. I'll say one last thing. When I first came to Mississippi in 1971, this was not a university, it was a college, and it was all white. Yeah. Very different now. So the late hour, we'll let our panelists uh, maybe wrap up the final thoughts. No, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to summarize the summer that didn't end. This is a study of uh, the council, uh, council of Federated Organization and the kind of activities they did in organizing the youth. And uh, I will send it to anybody who wants my email address and all that. So this is a continuing activity. And it's up to you because our generation had the white Ku Klux Klan, you know, and the citizen council that was monitoring what we were doing. Now we have uh, white people, you know, <laughs> in charge. How many judges you have? Yeah. <laughs> Quite so you can't expect just because you have a black person up there in office, you know, you're free. No yeah. way. You gotta be involved. Going to the school board meetings, that's very boring. Mm -hmm. Going to the uh, council meetings, that's very boring. And have input on the budget and decisions that they're making about your community. And, uh, and this is not exciting at all. It's just hard work. Mm -hmm. But this is what has to be done. And, and I just want to second what uh, uh, Brother Du just said, uh, just briefly, because he, uh, he said something that, that uh, the, the enemy now has figured out that, that the best way to fight us is to co-opt us. Mm -hmm. And they do it throughout our community with people with jobs and positions, and uh, even in public office. Uh, most of the people that, uh, or I won't say most, but a good number of the people that we get in public office are not proactive. I, I was recalled from the city council in Berkeley, the only person in the history of the city to ever be ousted from office in a special election. They accused me of introducing race into the politics of the city and, and wow. being an obstructionist and causing the meetings to break up in disarray. And I did all of those things. And, 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 and I think that you have to be... Guilty, huh? Yes, and I think you have to be willing to be ousted. If, you, if everybody is happy with what you're doing, you're not doing the right thing. And if you go to a meeting and if you're quiet, then you ought not to be there. You ought to ask questions, you ought to challenge people, uh, and don't worry that they'll whisper or they'll say that, well, you know, he's just a troublemaker or she shouldn't be here or whatever. That's why you're on this earth, to speak up and make a difference. Um, for the young people who are interested in voter registration, I just want to share with you some things that are going on. There are about 451,000 
African Americans in Mississippi that are not registered to vote. There is a rather aggressive voter registration campaign going on that is a coalition of the National Panhandle Council of Mississippi, the NAACP, General Missionary Baptist Convention of Mississippi, and the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So if you are interested, we have had voter registrations at Mississippi Valley State. We are going to Jackson State as a coalition of Greek level organizations and student government associations and others. Um, there is a training schedule for September 29th at Temple of Praise Church here in Cleveland. But there are others. Kappa Pi chapter on this campus has received today from me, I'm Dr. Elaine Baker, um, some information about student guides for, uh, for voter registration. We have a listing of the criteria for all of the states. So if you're interested, you can just talk to Kappa Pi chapter on this campus. I will certainly be available to facilitate, and I am from Mount Bayou. We can talk about some of the discussions later. Uh, Mrs. Hamer died in the hospital there in Mount Bayou, the Royal Hospital. And we're also very proud to say she's an honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. All right. That's okay, now the problem will be. I'd love to get everybody to see it. Check out your feelings, book and talk. I'll get out and send you a Lord Keogh's newsletter. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me from me. Turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking. I'm gonna talking. I'm marching up the freedom land. Ain't gonna let Maine but to turn me around. Turn me round, turn me round, hang on a lead vein capital. Turn me round, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Hang on a lead injustice, turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Turn me round, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, I'm marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let miseducation turn me round, turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let miseducation turn me round, I keep on a walking. Keep on a talking, I'm gonna build a brand new world.